Mr. Chancellor, it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. George Ivama, Dean of the Faculty of Science at Carleton University. An internationally respected research biologist and environmentalist, Dr. Ivama joined Carleton University in July 2007. He spent much, much of his career on Canada's two coasts before coming to Carleton University. He held faculty and research positions at the University of British Columbia, and more, most recently served as Dean of, faculty, uh, Dean of Science and then Acting Vice President Academic at Acadia University in Nova Scotia. He also served as Director General of the National Research Council's Institute for Marine Biosciences in Halifax. Driven by curiosity and passion, Dr. Iwama inspires his colleagues and students and fosters a network of collaboration and support with research partners around the world. He is also a tireless champion of the academic success of the talented students of the Faculty of Science. It is perhaps his understanding of how students learn and when, when learning begins that led him to his most recent venture in publishing. According to an article in the Ottawa Citizen, Dr. Iwama is the man who can explain DNA to a four-year-old. Through picture books, he is introducing a new generation to cell biology and particu particularly genetics, as he explains DNA to beginner readers through the adventures of Naomi, Andrew, and Digger the dog. We are very pleased that he has joined us at Carleton University. I now invite Dean Ivama to deliver the convocation address. I didn't know you knew that much about my book. Thank you very much, Professor Handulapur, for that kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. Chancellor Garneau, President Portem Mahmoud, Vice President Academic Raymond Hansen of Algonquin College, Mr. Jackson, Vice Chair of our board, colleagues, honored guests, allow me to add my warm congratulations to our graduates, our friends and family, and welcome to Spring Convocation in the Faculty of Science at Carleton. You'll be receiving your bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees today, and what a great day it is indeed. The exams and reports and field trips, experiments, and yes, even that thesis is all done. Congratulations. This is my first Spring Convocation, and it's my honor and pleasure to present a few comments to you. And the only credentials I have to be standing in front of you today is that I've got a few more years of living than you, but I am a very proud member of Carleton. Let me begin by reminding you to thank those who supported you through your studies and research, and we've thanked them uh, through Professor Hamdulapur's uh, talk. Whether it was financial, moral, or physical support, we owe a lot to our families, our friends, and those we may, even those we have, may have not even met. I am thinking particularly of those providers of fellowships and scholarships whose generosity has made it possible for you to be sitting here as a graduate of this university. Let's also thank our professors and staff that have contributed in so many ways to our learning. I'm so heartened to see so many of our wonderful teachers here on, on our, our stage today, and it's a show of their commitment to see this many uh, in, in today's ceremony. So thank you very much for your contributions. Please remember them during this special day as we celebrate your accomplishments. You came to Carleton four, five, six, let's say several years ago with certain expectations. Some of you came because it was expected or asked of you. Others came with a pack of friends. Some came seeking training for a job or to get that preliminary requirement so you could go on to professional schools. Some came with hopes of enlightenment and inspiration and others arrived at our gates without a clue as to how or why you came. Those of you who are here for graduate studies may have come to conduct research with a leading scientist in your field of interest or just the sense that graduate studies could help your career. 
Whatever the reason, we are delighted that you did, and more so that you are here today graduating. Today is a day to celebrate your academic accomplishments that have culminated in your degree and your, your right to be a Carleton alumnus. You are now joining over 100,000 alumni making differences in all walks of life around the world. Does a Carleton education equip you well for this changing world? I'm convinced the answer is a clear and loud yes. The list of graduates that have gone on to make real differences in this world is a very long one. But let me mention two or three. Shauna Brown, Carleton graduate, Senior Vice President of Business Operations at Google, who went on to earn a master's degree in economics and philosophy at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar, and a PhD in postdoctoral training at Stanford University. Peter Grunberg, who was a postdoctoral fellow here with the NRC in the chemistry department between 1969 and 1972, whose research in giant magnetic res resistance effects forever changed how data is stored in computers, was honored and recognized with a Nobel Prize last year. Rowan Thompson, who is a current postdoctoral fellow at Carleton in the physics department, conducting cancer-related research in ra radiotherapy physics. Dr. Thompson, declared by Chatelaine as one of 80 amazing Canadian women to watch, was recently awarded the L'Oreal Canada for Women in Science Research Excellence Fellowship. Dr. Thompson sat where you are now sitting in 2003, the year Shauna Brown took the reins as senior VP at Google. With innovation, innovative and leading research, as well as cherished values in teaching, Carleton University is a place where learning, discovery, and human relations thrive. The accomplishments of our present chancellor has already been mentioned. Two, present, two past chancellors were honored with Nobel Prizes, Dr. Gerhard Hertzberg, a scientist, and Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson. With the successes of our faculty and staff and the inspired leadership of our presidents and vice presidents, our, your alma mater continues to grow and develop as a very special place. When I speak with alumni of Carleton around the world, they all acknowledge the excellent training they received here and how they wouldn't be where they are in their careers without their Carleton degrees. But more often than not, a smile comes over their face and they say, and you know, I had a really great time there. I hope you will echo those sentiments as graduates. We will carry on our work here to raise Carleton's profile as your pride continues to be well-founded and the value of that degree you receive today increases. All of us cannot and will not become champions of industry, famous for our discoveries in science or leaders in government. I have no doubt, however, that each of us, each of you, can make a difference to the people and the environment in this world we share. I hope that the significance of today, your successes in achieving this milestone will remain with you for the rest of your life and help you become the engaged, respectful citizens that this world needs so desperately. But today is also about the future, about what you will do when you leave those gates later today. So allow me to make a few brief comments about this aspect of your degree, the threshold to tomorrow, and the decisions you will make and the actions you will take. Vice President Hamdulapur, in his introduction a few moments ago, listed a number of positions I have held, I have had the privilege of holding in my career to date. I've also been a house painter, a college teacher, a conservation officer, to name a few others. The job doesn't matter. What I believe matters is that it felt like it was the right thing to be doing. I thought that each of those jobs was the very best job in the world, and I hold that view today as the Dean of Science here at Carleton. I've always counseled my students to never leave something as important as a job or career solely to your brain. It's a fallible organ prone to mistakes. I would like you to give that, I would like to give you that advice today. Listen to your heart and have the courage to act on what feels like the right thing to do. One can make all the pros and cons lists about any opportunity or decision, yet many times in your heart it is clear as to what the best or right decision is. Listen to that voice. There is so little of such training at formal institutions. We find ourselves with crowded curricula with little or no time to have those important talks with our mentors and teachers. This challenge grows as what we know, the content of science, the fruits of our research, grows at an increasing rate. I've had the privilege of interviewing many students and potential employees through the jobs I've held. CVs and resumes get the applicants into the interview room. 
but the winners are those with the passion in their voice that displays not only competence, but the commitment and energy you want on your team. My colleagues who are deans of admissions in medical and graduate schools share this view. So how do you develop that? There was plenty of that passion on display at the National Science Fair a couple of weeks ago here in Ottawa. As I walked the floor and talked to those young scientists, it seemed to me that some of the most excited and enthusiastic about their discoveries were among the youngest. As if the necessity of words, of language, was hindering and diluting the value of their groundbreaking discoveries, they eloquently and excitedly told me about the antimicrobial properties of garlic, the relative merits of different alternative sources of energy, and many, many others. I know that the fire and light in their eyes comes from the fun and excitement of discovery and learning. Unfortunately, and ironically, those lights sometimes dim over the years of schooling and training. Be very aware of this, and if at all possible, work at what you enjoy doing. This is my single strongest hope for each of you. Our world today and your world tomorrow is a fascinating place. Health, the environment, energy, information and communication technologies, and security drive current scientific research around the world. Science and technology are producing knowledge at unexpected rates, and this explosion of knowledge is being expressed in a language that is increasingly difficult to understand, hence my children's book. Even for scientists, over your lifetime, the sum of that knowledge and its, and its effects on the world may be greater than that of the past 400 years. That's about the time Sir Francis Bacon was developing the concept of controlled experiments and when the first telescopes were being invented. It seems impossible to imagine the changes you'll see in your lifetime. What are the pressing questions today? There are many. How do stem cells develop into different tissues? exploring the mass of subatomic particles as articulated by string theory, exploring the nature of dark energy. The internet today is made up of a trillion links, a million emails each second, exabytes of memory. These features are approaching the level of that organ between your ears, but it's doubling every year, but not our brains. New ways of sharing knowledge and information are emerging. The collective or the wiki is a fascinating phenomenon. It's fast, cheap, and certainly out of control. Computers are constantly enabling new ways to interact and collaborate. Sequencing the first human genome costs about $10 billion, involving hundreds of people over 10 years. You will soon be able to share, have your personal genome sequenced in a few days at a cost of about $1,000. A thought for next Christmas. We are able to build machines that fit, fit easily into your blood cells and cures for many lethal diseases have been discovered and developed. Science and technology will continue to become more interdisciplinary. Some of us will remember when university curricula had simple names, biology, chemistry, and they still do. Then came along biochemistry, biogeochemistry, bioinformatics, pharmacogenomics, proteomics, and so on. One day, a student stopped me in the hall where he said, excuse me, aren't you the dean of science? And I said, yes. In a mildly exasperated tone, he asked me, when are we getting a program in molecular forensic archaeology? Because so-and-so university's got a really great one. One reason for this growth of new, in, new disciplines is that the exploration of our world is requiring multi- and interdisciplinary approaches. Information and communication technologies will learn for processes in our brain. High-performance computing and the ability to manage and explore huge bodies of data will enable explorations of the arts to benefit our understanding of how proteins interact in the cells of our body. Profound questions of the world are being addressed cooperatively among scientists from around the world in projects such as the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, the Neptune Project on the West Coast, the Canadian Light Source, and the Large Hedron Collider Project in Europe. But large questions are not new. Galileo, Darwin, Newton, all would be in good company today. But we are affecting our planet in ways and of a magnitude that are unprecedented. The nanoparticles that stain-proof our shirts can be a new pollutant in the air we breathe. Will we have to turn to biotechnology to feed the world? How can it be that with our intelligence and our abilities, we have people dying each day of starvation and obesity? The critical importance of science and scientific knowledge in society is therefore also increasing whether it be the diseases that affect us, 
the effects of our activities on the Earth, or the potential and promise of new technologies, we must balance the benefits to society and the world with the risk and costs of those technologies. It is up to you, up to us, working together to apply our talents and knowledge to the needs of the people of this world. I would suggest to you that that is, as Carlton's motto reminds us, ours the task eternal. Dr. Gordon Schramm was a native of Smithville, Ontario, a soldier, a physicist, teacher and administrator, and first chancellor of Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. He was a friend of Lester B. Pearson, our past chancellor, Nobel laureate that was mentioned, as they trained together in the Canadian Officers Training Corps and served together under the command of Vincent Massey. Dr. Strom began his university education at Victoria College at the University of Toronto, a place where our incoming president, Ro Roseanne Ronte, served as president not too long ago. Gordon Strom addressed my alma mater about 50 years ago. I wasn't there. I want to share one sentence from his talk with you. It is said that there are two kinds of education, the kind you have to get to live and the kind you have to live to get. Your time at Carleton and the lessons you have learned at this great university have equipped you well for the many challenges and opportunities that lie before you, the first kind of education. Now you are on your way to continue getting the ladder. Time passes quickly. Go forth with a keen eye for opportunities to improve this world that we share, with a compassionate heart for those with whom we share it, and good luck and good health that all this can happen for a very long time. Thank you.